have the distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Miss Laura Forzik. Uh, she is the owner of space consulting firm Astrolytical, uh, specializing in space science, industry, and policy, and offering space career coaching services. Uh, Laura is also a NASA subject matter expert for planetary science missions, and she's also the primary author of Astrolytical Explore Flybys and Orbits Analytics. Um, she's also the author of Rise of the Space, Space Age Millennials, and is a frequent source for news publications, including CNN, C C BBC, NBC, CNBC, Financial Times, regional newspapers such as Washington Post. She is all over the place and on multiple podcasts. You can see her about anywhere. She's very well spoken. Laura, we're very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I didn't know you are going to read the whole thing. <laughs> so um, I appreciate that. So I'm glad to be with you today. A um, little bit surprised at the topic I'm going to be speaking on. You might have gathered by my bio, I am not a business person. I am a scientist by training. My background is in astrophysics and planetary science. And this might be the first strictly business talk I've ever given. I have no business degrees, no MBA. So I come at this from an outsider's point of view. I am by no means a business theory expert. I am myself a small business owner, but that doesn't mean I know much about business, I swear. <laughs> so I'm just going to come at that with that caveat that what you're hearing may not um, jive with some of the things that are taught in business school simply because I've never come from business school. This is my own personal experience and my own experience observing the space industry, which I have been doing for uh, many years now and um, love doing it. I, I love the industry that we are blossoming into. Um, so I think that I was handed this topic based on the fact that I recently wrote a blog article, which you can see published on the Astrolytical blog, astrolytical.com slash blog. Um, and it is how to start, how to spot a failing space tourism company. And that comes from research that we just did and put out in January about the space tourism sector, private space flight sector. Um, we looked at some of the, uh, the, the emerging companies that are trying to pursue crude uh, space stations. Um, and so there are several companies that have realistic plans and some that don't have realistic plans at all. And we analyzed those and, and, and ranked them in the order of where they are in terms of short-term, medium-term, long-term, or not happening at all. Um, and um, coming from that research, there were some key things that stuck out to me as to some companies that are hanging in there or making grand plans, grand announcements, and simply not going to happen just because of the reality of the world that we live in. And um, I also want to say that I have have no, uh, you know, no ill will towards anybody who tries to do some grand plans, especially in our industry where we're always forward thinking, we're always trying to break new ground and be innovative. And I applaud people who are working towards those grand visions. Uh, even if I'm very critical of what they're trying to do, I still think it's fantastic that they put their, themselves and their resources and their professions and all of that on the, on the line. Um, I myself have been part of a uh, failed space to startup, which I'll talk about later. And and I've also had a very, very small role in a failed space tourism startup. Um, so that was, um, you know, it's, it's humbling. I'm sure some of the people watching this have been also either running or been part of a failed space startup. And it is very humbling, but we try our best. And I do believe that the industry learns from every failure. It learns from every success and it, and it learns from the things that don't quite happen. So without further ado, um, I'm, I don't have slides simply because we all get slide fatigue. So I'm just speaking to you, but if you do happen to want to follow along, you can go to the Astrolytical blog. I'm just going to be outlining that and then speaking off of my personal experiences. So um, one of the things that you might want to look at uh, I, I posted that uh, link in the chat. If anybody wants to capture it, uh, it's already up there. Okay, great. One of the things that I do want to point you to is the, the graphic at the top of that blog article. So if you just look at that and nothing else, that's fine because that is a really good outline and that doesn't even cover all of the failed space tourism efforts of the past 20 two-ish years. I actually left off a couple. Um, I mean to update that graphic, but um, you know, there's just so many that I, 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 there's, there's a lot. So I put that graphic up there as an example of some of the failed tourism efforts that um, sounded fantastic at the time and that um, some people still believe in, but um, some of the ones that 
maybe are forgotten about. Um, but at the time, at, at the moment they are announced, these are grand plans and some of them are more realistic than others. For example, there was um, the Hilton Hotels, Hilton International Company, you know, very, very, you know, stable company. Um, you know, I don't know how well they've fared with the pandemic, but I assume they're still doing extraordinarily well. Well known company. Back in 1999, they announced they wanted to put together a space. Islands. Now, this is not to be confused with the Space Island Group, which was at the same time in a similar concept. Um, but they, this, the Hilton Hotels, they wanted to do something called Space Islands, which they wanted to construct space hotels in in sort of a ring formation, sort of like the um, the the movie um, 2001: Space Odyssey. And they they uh, wanted to use spent space shuttle tanks to do this. Um, the idea of using sp space shuttle tanks or rocket tanks is a, an old idea that keeps getting resurfaced every so often. So in 1999, this is what Hilton Hotels came out with. And it sounds so promising, right? Because Hilton Hotels has a grand reputation. They have a stable funding source because they have a stable business already. Um, no doubt that there's still, um, you know, Hilton Fortune. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the, the net worth of the Hilton family is, but they still have that. They probably have um, wealthy connections to get venture capital uh, partners. Um, but we don't have a Hilton Space Islands space station right now, right? That did not happen. Um, and so even when something sounds like it's really promising, there are things that that can stop it to, um, you know, <laughs> create a failed company. Um, another one that was super promising and a lot of people uh, fought back on me on including them, but Bigelow Aerospace. So, um, you know, moment of silence for Bigelow Aerospace. <laughs> They've been gone now for 11 months, technically not in bankruptcy, technically not totally gone, they may still resurface. But in March of last year, they laid off almost all of their employees and they've been um, dormant ever since. But in 2000, no, the end of 1999 is when they made their announcement that they wanted to do space tourism. And they've had several space tourism proposals, uh, but the farthest they ever gone is launching uncrewed hardware. And that's a great success, right? They had two free flyers up there um, and they have one module that is still attached to the International Space Station that's still being used. So they had some really great successes, which is why some people um, didn't like that I included them in the failed space tourism report. But <laughs> I do think that they are failed in the sense that they never did get anybody up there. They never did have anybody fly on a space hotel or have a, a habitat on the moon or any of the, the human space flight aspects that they wanted to do. Um, so that's an idea of something promising. Something not promising, um, I wanna take your attention to a company that was a uh, big deal two years ago. Um, big deal in, in our circles, that is. Nobody outside our circles knows of them. <laughs> but uh, if you remember a company called Orion Span, and they have a grand plan for uh, hotels. They, this company still exists. Um, they're still trying to raise money. Um, two years ago, they tried to raise money through uh, crowdfunding. They were um, trying to raise money on a website that allowed participants to uh, kind of, anybody around the world, I, I think, I don't know if it was US specific, but anybody you know in the general public could um, go and try to get equity from them um, to participate in them raising money. And they wanted to raise something like a million dollars and they didn't even come close. <laughs> and so the, based on the rules of the website, they actually weren't allowed to keep any of that money because they raised so little of it, um, which actually they raised almost uh, 2,500, $2,500, which is, is nothing to sneeze at, but nowhere near as close to a million. And a million dollars is nowhere near close to what you're going to need for a space station, a human space station. So um, they didn't they didn't make it. Um, and as far as I know, they're still probably trying to raise money. They have no hardware. They have no um, public recent announcements. And as far as LinkedIn goes, they have no new hires or anything like that. Um, another company that made an announcement a week ago on very similar type of thing also probably not going to make it that is the foundation the gateway foundations orbital assembly corporation trying to do a very similar thing also don't really have any money funding hardware they've been around for about 12 years now um, their space station that they just announced is actually the same space station that they've been trying to do for um, like eight years or something so um, 
there are some red flags that pop up and a red flag doesn't mean that a company can't make it, but enough red flags uh, really should give you pause. That should be a big giant red light to say stop and look to see what's going on. You know, one or two hurdles can maybe be overcome, but enough hurdles and it's gonna stop them no matter who they are. And so um, just the basics of what those red flags might be and funding, 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 that's the number one red flag. A lot of the successful space startups that we see today have either a wealthy executive founder or a wealthy venture capital or a, a, wealth, uh, a, a really well done uh, series of venture capital funding, seed funding. Um, and so that is the biggest indicator of how well a company is going to do is that especially initial funding, um, you, you still need funding throughout the company's lifetime, but if you can get really good initial funding from a founder, early seed capital, um, even contracts, um, NASA contracts, uh, Department of Defense contracts or other um, government agencies, uh, all of that money in hand, money to really kickstart your business, to kickstart hiring, to kickstart, um, you know, design and manufacturing, prototyping, building, testing, any of that, all of that can build momentum. Without that funding, without that reliable funding, um, companies kind of, you know, just treading water, um, might even, you know, be actually failed, but not, not officially failed, you know? Um, so, these are not memorandums of understanding. These are not letters of intent. These are not promises of money. So a lot of companies will say that they have X number of potential customers, X number of letters of intent from customers. That doesn't count because that's not money in hand. That's great for saying that we've got this promised money, but that doesn't necessarily mean they can get that promised money. They need to fulfill whatever their goal is, whether it's hardware or software or whatever it is they're trying to do. They need to do that before they can get those customers to pay them that money. Um, and so funding is really the number one. If, if a company does not have funding or if they're going through unusual methods to try to get funding, um, so I, I hate to bring up that example again of the Orbital Assembly Corporation, but they actually um, tried a, a crowd raise uh, Kickstarter a few years ago, not to raise money for their company, but to raise money to build a video. So if that, like, that, that actually made me laugh, like, if you're trying to raise money in that way, not even to advance your company, um, then that is a gigantic red flag that something is off there. Um, so if you're a paper company, if you're just a website, if you're a science communications company, you know, that a video is great. Um, but if you're actually trying to physically build hardware to launch to space, you need the money to build that hardware. Um, so experience. Experience is something that can be bought. Um, but it's really great if a company founder, company executives, early hires already have that really good experience. Um, and this could come, you know, at a young age. It could be, uh, we've seen a lot of like SpaceX employees spin off their own companies. Uh, you know, it could be just somebody who has really good experience in a graduate program or even an undergraduate accelerate, you know, something like that that gives them experience in what they're trying to do. Um, there is a company, um, that is trying to do uh, near space, high altitude space ballooning. And they are based out of Spain and they actually were working with an already existing Spanish company trying to do something very similar. And then that company, the new one, um, they have venture capital money but no experience. They don't have any experience at all in space, aviation, ballooning, um, anything that would give them a leg up on actually doing what they say they're going to do. They just have the connections to money. And again, money can buy experience, but you have to see who those early hires are. So if they don't have anybody who has really good experience in there doing exactly what they say they're going to do or something very similar to what they say they're going to do, then that's a red flag. Um, the lack of experience can slow down a company or can give them unrealistic expectations of what they're trying to accomplish. Um, Realism, <laughs> that, that brings me to realism. So if a company is saying that they are going to send humans to Mars in five years, giant red flag, right? <laughs> um, and I say that because somebody just put out a, an article I was just reading before this talk about SpaceX sending humans to Mars in, in five years, which, you know, we all know that Elon Musk could possibly and probably send humans to Mars eventually, but it's not happening in five years. So if another company is pops up and says, hey, we're going to do some fantastic space thing in X number of years, and it just sounds too good to be true, it's because it is too good to be true. One thing that space tells us is that schedules always slip and that things are always more expensive than we think 
they're going to be. <laughs> and so um, take those gigantic promises with a gigantic grain of salt. Um, you have to have a realistic schedule idea. We've seen how hard, especially human space flight, it's, it's a little bit different with um, you know just payloads, but human space flight takes so long because human lives are on the line. So we've seen companies like Virgin Galactic, which in 2004 licensed that um, Ansari X Prize technology that technology, the um, spaceship company's technology had already flown humans to space. And yet 2004 to now, we've seen very few progress with, with Virgin Galactic. They still have technological problems that they're trying to get by in order to fly paying customers. Um, you know, we've, we've actually heard Elon Musk say it's taken them way too long to get humans to orbit. Um, you know, he complained about that last year when, he, when, when SpaceX finally had that fantastic milestone of launching people to the International Space Station, Elon Musk was frustrated how long it took, but that's just simply how long it takes. Um, Blue Origin, I think, can we go back and forth with how frustrated we are at Blue Origin and how they haven't flown anybody to space yet, even though they've had many successful launches of New Shepard. Um, and so we, we know space takes time. Um, even with a company like SpaceX that, you know, rolls out those Starship SN9, SN10, you know, crashes them, um, those are prototypes, those are, or those are um, uncrewed prototypes. So if you're talking about then putting humans on a Starship, that's going to take a a lot longer. Progress is the next thing. So there are some companies, some startups, quote unquote, that have been around for decades and made no real progress. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking particular of some small sat launchers that just kind of stick around and maybe once or twice a year may make some announcement or announce a new partnership or, um, you know, in some way end up in the news, but they're not making any true progress. So you have to see if a company is actually doing what they say they're going to do, right? The proof is in the prototyping, the testing, and the launching, or if it's not a launch company, um, you know, the, the software enabling, whatever it is they say they're going to do, they have to make progress. Um, if they're not making progress, there's um, a lot of questions I get. Why am I so down on Blue Origin? I love Blue Origin as a company. I think they're a fantastic company. I think they've done great things with, um, you know, the payloads that they've launched on New Shepard, but I am down on them with human spaceflight because we have not seen that progress in all of these years where they said um, that they, in 2016, they actually announced, which is unusual for them, that they they wanted to launch paying customers by 2018 and here we are in 2021 and they haven't even launched any of their own employees yet so progress is a good indicator of how well a company is doing um, you can see companies that uh you know might have had prestige like moon express my heart goes out to Moon Express because I think they had great promise at one point and they were selected as a NASA commercial lunar payload services clips provider. Um, but then a few months ago, there was a, a really heartfelt article that was published uh, about, uh, it was an interview with Bob Richards and, and just like the company's just barely hanging on. And so you don't know what's going on behind the scenes unless you have that insider information. A company may seem like they're doing really well, but the proof is in the progress if they're able to make progress. And of course, some companies are stealth companies, some companies, um, you don't know truly the progress they're making because they keep it under wraps. Um, but if it's a launch company, it's hard to, uh, you know, it's hard to hide launches. Uh, so that is in a nutshell with human space flight side, how to spot a failing company. And um, some of the things that you might want to keep in mind here is that you don't necessarily want to rush human spaceflight at all. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing that companies go slower than they intend to with human spaceflight because lives are on the line. But when you're talking about um, return on investment for investors or so a lot of these companies I just met, not a lot, but it's some of these companies I just mentioned and similar companies are trying to go public or are, have gone public um, with mergers, facts, that kind of thing. Um, so that means that they thought or are still thinking that they are close to making um, a profit revenue. And um, I don't know if they intended to go so slowly uh, when they are already publicly traded. Um, so there's just a lot going on in the space industry to talk to in, in just half an hour. I've already meant 20 minutes and I didn't mean to speak this long. But if you have um, any questions about anything I just said, let me know. But, but first, I wanted to talk about my own personal experience where I was a bit naive. 
and did not see the red flags and joined a space startup that was based in Switzerland. It was called Swiss Space Systems. You might remember it. And um, my immediate boss was fantastic. He was based in New York, uh, in, in Washington, DC. I was based in Florida, running the Florida office at Kennedy Space Center. We had grand plans to do spaceports all around the world. Um, they had already had hardware. They were modifying a plane to do um, the, the, the zero G parabolic flights. They um, had, uh, contract already to launch a payload because the idea was to do parabolic flights and also do suborbital launches on a space plane, which would then also launch satellites into orbit, uh, like on a Kickstarter kind of thing, not Kickstarter, but um, you know, a kick launch. Um, and so they had all these great plans and they already had a MOU for a customer. Um, they had, you know, they had a few contracts. We had a contract out of uh, Florida called, with, with Space Florida because um, we had partnered with an Israeli company. Um, so there were all kinds of really good things there, but I didn't miss the red flags with the CEO. Um, and the CEO ended up being sort of a shady character and the company went bankrupt. But even if there aren't any immediate red flags, um, sometimes just digging below the surface can reveal things. And that's why I am a big fan of investigative journalism. I, I, my hat's off to the journalists who um, really cover our industry and can dig in there to see where there might be stuff that is behind the scenes, a little bit of shady business. Um, and we've seen that with other launch companies recently. And so um, with my own experience, uh, it ended up being quite a big financial and professional setback when the company I worked for went bankrupt. And they still owe me quite a bit of money, unfortunately, in back wages. So um, the reason I talk about this is because I think it hurts our industry when we buy into the hype, when we don't question the hype. Um, it hurts the employees who work for those companies. It works the it hurts the employees that work for competitive companies that maybe are going to lose uh, venture capital or lose contracts, um, lose customers potentially because of the other company that's promising, over promising and can't deliver. It hurts um, stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are the funding agencies, the venture capitalists, the, um, the public. Um, you know, in all these ways, if we overpromise, if we buy into the hype, then we can harm the credibility of our own industry. So I think it's very important that we be realistic about uh, what it is that companies can accomplish. Companies themselves are going to toot their own horn, right? I've read enough pitch decks to know that companies are never going to say anything that's negative in their own pitch deck. They're never going to, they're always going to take the most optimistic projections about the space industry. But then it's up to us to be more critical, um, whether it's you talking to other people in your own business or whether it's you talking to the media or, or the media themselves, um, just be more critical of what you see in here because unfortunately we have a long litter of failed companies crumpled behind us on the street, um, which doesn't mean that it's a bad thing to try. It just means we need to be more realist realistic in what we say. And I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Forshik. Uh, you know, you, you started with, I'm not sure why I'm on this panel, but you totally nailed why I wanted you on this panel. So hats off to you. Thank you very much for that. Um, really what you're saying is we need a reality check. So, um, you know, last month you were with us, we talked a lot about economics. We talked about the industry and the money behind it, but this is the flip side, right? This is the industrial base where we're trying to develop uh, you know, these new capabilities. You know, I, I, I picked your topic because I'm a failed startup, right? Like Liftport, uh, you know, was a real company a long time ago. Uh, we had 14 people and one day it was just over and it was over in an afternoon and you know, it took a fair amount of courage to restart this as a company, as a project, because uh, I know that there's a lot of, you know, this, this industry is littered with failures. But I wanted you to come in and talk about those, uh, you know, this history, right? So you talked about Bigelow. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard names like, uh, like Rotary Rocket or Beal, right? Those are, Rotary Rocket's an $800 billion loss. Rotary, uh, Rotary's 800 billion, 800, sorry, 800 million. Um, uh, Beal, I think is 200 million. 
Um, I think Blue bought Beal's assets, if I remember right. Um, I think that's where they're located. But but this industry has just this field littered with bodies, and it's sad. It's frustrating. Um, but I really appreciate your comments uh, that you posted the other day. I'm like, yeah, th- we need to talk about this. So don't sell yourself short. You got, uh, you got something good to say there. So thank you. Um, with your own experience, you are building a startup, right? It's small, uh, but you're building a startup. I'm rebuilding a startup. Given the red flags, what's the thing to avoid, right? Personal experience, your, your research experience, what's the thing to adv- avoid? One of the things that I got as advice um, is to not hire too quickly if you don't have the extended funding that you think that you're going to have to to sustain all the people because it's really painful to hire and then have to lay off people. And I know from other founders and other executives that have had to do that and you really lose talent, you, you hurt the people, you might not be able to get them back. Um, and so it's, it's a real challenge to know how much runway you have um, to be able to hire people and how many. And I know I said earlier that hiring initially and getting that momentum is a really good thing, um, but that's a big red flag there. I mean, just for personal, you know, we're all about people, right? This is an industry, not just about space and cool assets and where we want to go, it's about the people. And so um, we want to take care of our own. And so um, I have taken that advice myself and been very selective about how I hire and who I hire. and. Um, and just five years into my company, still very selective and very clear, cautious about that because I want to take care of the people who are under me. Um, and I think another thing would be expanding too quickly. Um, and I mean this in terms of not just people, I mean, um, in terms of the, the facilities. Uh, so if you suddenly have a gigantic warehouse or a facility that you need to do all of the you know, maintenance and the, the you know, electricity and all those other bills that come with it, insurance, um, you, then you might find that you are house poor in a sense um, and, and you don't want that either. You're going to need facilities if you're building safe hardware, but maybe you can borrow something or um, you know, think about a smaller facility or partner with somebody or uh, you know, in some way get some kind of discount with a university. You know, there's so many different ways you can do that without being house poor, <laughs> for lack of a better term. There might be a business term, I don't know it. Um, another thing would be to, I think, be more realistic with, and I, and I know I said that no one's going to you know, downplay themselves in their own pitch deck, but being more realistic with investors about how long that ROI is going to be. Um, so some investors might want a return in like, you know, three years versus 10 years versus they're long, long long-term because they know space is long long term. That's probably rare. But, um, you know, just being realistic about when that return is going to be, that way you don't end up with um, investors pulling out, which we've seen um, can really devastate companies. Investors that you thought were solid suddenly back out because they are afraid of the risk or you're taking too long, whatever the case may be. I mean, um, you just have to be realistic up up front, I think. And of course, no one predicts their schedules perfectly. Um, But I think that's... uh, a key area where um, investors are expecting to get their, their, you're not, you're not their only investment, right? So they're expecting to get investment at this year. And if, if you, you're going to take five extra years longer, then maybe they're not okay with that. Um, so, um, you know, investors expect to lose money, but <laughs> um, it still might hurt the entire industry if an investor pulls out and then suddenly there's a cascade. And we have seen where, where one company fails and that causes other companies who have relied on them to, that, to fail. It's an unfortunate domino effect. Well, it kills me that people have a different expectation in our industry than they would if they were going to start a local bagel shop, right? You still have ROI. You still have staffing. You still have to pay your taxes. They treat it like this. It's this, you know, Star Trek adventure, and they don't necessarily deal with the, you know, nuts and bolts of building a company start with build a company and then add the complexity of a space company on top of it uh yeah i i see i see some of this stuff and it just it just boggles me some days all right uh you've gotten some great comments in the uh in the chat so they definitely appreciate your your honesty and your realism um i i think this industry tends to spend so much time in the hype arena 
I, I certainly Liftport was guilty of it the first time we we went out. I mean, I have an entire wall of magazine covers, and it was really easy to believe the hype that we created. But uh, notice we don't we don't do that anymore. That's not that's not what we're doing. So uh, the, the, your comments the comments about you know appreciating the realism and the honesty are are, are definitely noted, um, and that it's a uh, it's a fine line, right? It's a fine line to try to try to do something no one's ever done, and yet uh, be honest about every step of the way. So it's it's difficult. Um, thank you very much, uh, Laura. We're gonna we're gonna move on. Um, you're are you sticking around for the panel? It's gonna yeah, be yeah. I'll be on the panel, and if people right. have questions, they can contact me directly. And I haven't looked at the chat yet, but I'll take a look at it now. Okay, terrific. And uh, so thanks, stick around here. And if you don't mind posting your uh, contact and LinkedIn in the chat, that would be helpful. Uh, Jordan, over to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And Laura, thank you very much. I'm also the founder of a technology startup here in Austin, Texas. And I think the wisdom and advice you gave is applicable across a lot of industries, not just space. So thank you for that.